Thank you so much for, for the invitation. I rarely get this opportunity, and also for my alma mater, where I did my master's in coaching, to, to share the story of how I built this business. And it all started, and I have five cards here to share with you, five strategies or principles. And this story starts at around 2014, 2015. I'm a, I'm a corporate employee. Um, at Google and I am heartbroken because I, I had just had my first child. I was striving hard for a promotion and I didn't get it. And it was a moment, I don't know if you've ever had this experience of a big career disappointment because I was traveling. I, I was trying to jungle the baby at home, traveling and- Recording in progress. Oh, oh. And, and at this, at moment, this moment, okay, okay, I hear, I hear Eddie, Eddie. Can we mute? Awesome. So 2015, heartbroken, didn't get the promotion. I'm not really sure what I want to do. Do I want to keep climbing this corporate ladder? What does this mean? I had been introduced to coaching. I had come for the first module of the master's at Ashridge and, and I fell in love with coaching. I was very interested, but I wasn't, I wasn't sure. Like I, coaching look, looked amazing, but it wasn't like in a, a click of a finger, this is what I wanna do for the rest of my life. And fast forward to today, I'll, I'll say the beginning of the story, the end, and then we'll fill in the gaps. I, I have my own coaching business, The Leader Path. It is a six-figure coaching business. I have around 10 coaching associates I bring into different projects. I have published a book with uh, Penguin. I coach for Ashridge and in Seattle Business School. And I was just invited for a TEDx talk. But I think most important from having a successful business is every morning I drop off my kids to school and then I walk for 40 minutes in the park, 45 minutes in the park talking with my mom in Greece. I don't start to work until 10. I take two days that I don't have any meetings and I have 12, this year it had 12 weeks of holidays a year. For me, having a coaching business is not only about the impact, uh, but it's around the freedom, doing job you love, work, helping other people, but having the freedom being outside of the nine to five and really having the business you want that fits your lifestyle. So let's start with, I try to deconstruct from there to here, what were the key big themes? The first one I would say, and let me show my first card is clarify what you want. And it sounds simple, it's not easy. First of all, if you want a successful coaching business, you need to be clear that you want a successful coaching business. And for me, it didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen the moment I took the coaching course. It actually took me three years from the first moment I crossed the doors at Ashridge to deciding to leave Google. And, what, and I think that was part of the confusion as well. I was trying to collect my coaching hours to get accredited as a coach, but also I was trying to get promoted and trying conflicting goals rather than focusing on ones. So how did it happen? How did I get more clarity? First, I started coaching. And that's one thing um, I wanted to encourage you if you are in a corporate job. And I think maybe we can launch a, a poll in a minute, Caroline, to see what, where the audience is. I would like to know how many of you are thinking of launching a coaching business. If you are, are not a coach yet, or you're not a full-time coach, I will say the first one is coach. If you want to be a chef, cook. If you want to be a singer, sing. If you want to be a coach, coach. And I, what I did, I started coaching internally in the company, outside, pro bono. I was volunteering. I went to my alumni and I said, I'm doing these coaching sessions. Why do you do this as an experiment? First, to see whether you like it. And the passion doesn't come in the beginning. The passion follows um, confidence and confidence follows competence. So that's how you start. You start coaching people. Let, let us uh, launch the poll. Caroline, would you like to launch the poll now to see um, 
what stage are you in your coaching journey? If you could take a moment to see, are you thinking of starting a coaching business? Do you have a job and then a coaching business on the side or your coaching business is your main source of income? You can take a moment to answer this so, so I can know and tailor the story accordingly. Okay. Caroline, I think you're on mute. I don't know if you're saying something. Oh, right. Sorry. My apology. So, yes. Can you see the result or would you like me to share the result? Uh, Please with share you? the result. I cannot see it. No. Let's so it. we've got 37% of the people who are thinking of starting a coaching business. 31% um, who are doing part-time coaching business. And we've got 32% um, as um, full-time or the coaching is their main source of income. So it's, it's really split. I love it. I love it. It's almost even sleep with a little majority of the people that are thinking about this. So great. The second thing I did in terms of clarifying that this is what I wanted apart from doing it was changing my environment. And it happened that I, I had a second maternity leave and I know it's not possible for everyone, but in my second maternity leave, I decided to go to my husband to quit their job and we went to a tropical island. It was a long-term dream. And I, I cannot undervalue the importance of me getting out of that bubble of London, corporate career, MBA, Google executives. I took out myself, like it was a, a break. And I'm there in Thailand and all, I surround myself with freelancers and entrepreneurs and digital nomads and people working from their laptop. And this six months, I, I started changing of seeing something else is possible. But it wasn't only the physical environment that I changed. And what I say, usually it's really hard to, to move your ladder in a different wall if you don't step out of the ladder. Like imagine you're climbing a ladder. It's, you cannot really move the ladder. You, like you need some, some stepping back, some taking a break or taking some distance can be helpful. But I also, I wanted to change my social media environment. So what did I do? I, I, there was the list. It was called 30 top coaching gurus in the world. You can Google that. They, they re refresh it every two years. And I found the top 30 coaching gurus and I started following them on the social media and and reading their books, and I wanted to be inspired and learn. So even my digital environment changed towards this new thing I was exploring. The third thing I did, I read somewhere that if you blog, you would, I, it will help you increase your self-awareness and identify what you're interested in. And it's a tip I give to many of my clients. And I started blogging on Medium, and I said, let me blog for a year. And after the year, I'll see what I blog about. And, and it wasn't a business development tool. My first ever blog post on Medium is still there. It was around breastfeeding because that was top of mind. So you can imagine, it, I wasn't using it as a career development tool. But two things happened. First, the blogging started taking off. I think it was the third article that was picked up by Huffington Post. And then I was like, oh, I can submit articles to publications. While I was still at Google, this was happening. But also after a year, I looked what I had written and it wasn't about digital advertising. I had written about personal development and leadership and it was a huge part of increasing the self-awareness. So these are the three tips of, that I did in terms of identifying what I wanted. I've also created a, um, a gift for you. I took it out of my Vision Path program. I work a lot of uh, helping entrepreneurs define their vision. And the gift is a five-minute visualization for you. It's just for the attendance of the webinar. It's at theleaderpath.com slash great day. It's five minutes guided visualization. What would be a great day for you? So you'll be in the follow-up. I'll, I'll put it in the chat as well. The second step it is let go of an aligned work places and people. And this is something throughout my journey, but I'm going to use this 
to talk a little bit about the decision of leaving the corporate job. Um, and by the time, while I was doing this three years, I was doing my master's uh, at Ashra. It took me four years. Like I had the job, babies. I, I wasn't one of those people that completed it in the two years. It took me a while. I gave myself this time. And it was two moments that were pivotal in me deciding to leave Google. One was I was studying for my master's and on ex existential coaching. And there was one question there. And the question was, what would you do if you had one year to leave? And I was like, oh gosh, I, I wouldn't be spending the last year of my life working in a corporate nine to five. Th this was not aligned anymore. Google used to be my dream job. I have an, a huge, an, another talk about how it used to be the dream job. By 2017, it wasn't anymore. So I came back from the second maternity thinking I'll stay for six months. And then, because I was thinking this question, right? If I had a year to leave, I wouldn't work at Google for the whole year. Let me work six months and then I'll quit. And I remember the moment in Tottenham Court Road, I'm going through the tube to the elevator, coming back from the maternity who was in Thailand and I'm crying. It was so difficult for me to just come back because I had moved on. I, I was in this already in this world of freedom and coaching. Coming back to the corporate life felt very painful. And it was better because there, there were nice people. They were, there was a, some pain waiting for me. Welcome back to work for my second maternity. But still this feeling of oh, I'm going back and I can't hold my tears in the tube elevator of having to go back to the corporate job. And I started doing it all the, at the same time. I think my fear of how is this going to work? I was doing the master's and I was working at Google and I had two small kids under four and I started having a coaching business on the side and I was building the website. I was driving myself a little bit too much on. And I, I mentioned two mistakes on the description. I said two mistakes you can make when you're transitioning. One mistake is actually not coach, not try it out waiting until the day because you might find out you don't even like it the second mistake I made was trying to do too much before I left the corporate life and the final trigger to make me decide to leave was a workshop I went from to it was delivered by coach Michael Neal and I took two of my clients I had a, a three clients at the time and the reason I had clients while I had a full-time job was that since the first day at Ashridge, I changed my LinkedIn, by the way, and I said, business leader at Google and executive coach. I, and I was signing my blog posts, business leader at Google. I was very transparent with my company and my employer. I'm doing this training. I'm doing this master's. I'm becoming a coach. This will benefit you. It will benefit my clients at Google. It will benefit my coworkers. I wasn't hiding this. I told the world, this is what I'm doing, especially because I was trying to collect the coaching hours and how could I coach people, even if it was pro bono, if they looked my profile and they looked I was doing sales at Google, like, it would be kind of weird. So that's another tip I have for this 37% of you that you may want to transition, tell the world before you're ready. I don't think that's faking it till you make it like you are coaching. So you are a coach if you're doing this or, or, or you're looking for coaching clients. Um, so I took my two clients and to go, I paid for them for this workshop by Michael Neal and I thought it will help them. But there was one idea shared into that workshop that did it for me and by Michael Neal. And the idea was something my look impossible because we're not aware of all the ideas and the opportunities that will come your way once you start moving towards the right direction. And this blew my mind. I was thinking what looks impossible right now is that I could leave Google, be a coach and maintain my lifestyle. Nobody was supportive of me leaving Google. My, my husband was not supportive. He was saying, you have coaching clients because you work at Google. 
my 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 dad was not supportive he was like are you going to leave the best employer in the world i was scared but it was this idea it looks impossible because i cannot predict right now all the ideas that will come through me and all the opportunities that will come through me once i start moving i come on from this talk i tell my husband that's it i'm quitting and 3 months later i'm stepping away the day I left Google, I wrote an article on LinkedIn to thank my employer because I still have such warm feelings towards Google. I stayed there eight years. They're still my client. I took so much, so much from them. So I, I was full of gratitude and again, crying, very emotional person. I was crying in the toilets the last day. So I'm writing this emotional article to thank Google for the eight years and all they've given me. And the article was called, okay, Google, it's time to say goodbye. And the article went viral. And all of a sudden, the first day of my new freedom as an entrepreneur, and, and not mega viral, right? 50,000 views, like viral is supposed to be up above 100,000 views, but it was enough for me to jump my LinkedIn following and have like 20 emails inbound of people that wanted to test coaching with me. What happened though is none of those 20 people converted because I was already burned out. Those three months between coming back from maternity and giving my notice and leaving, I burned myself out. I was doing the masters, the kids, Google, the clients on the side. And, and I thought I was navigating it. And then it was one challenging client that I got uh, that had depression and I was just exhausted. I was still sleep deprived with the baby. So I'm leaving Google actually. The article goes viral, the clients are coming in. I feel exhausted. And I wanted to share this because that's a part of the journey. I, I wanted to share this. It's hard to try to do all those things. And if I were to do it again, maybe I wouldn't try to build everything while I still had the, it was fear that I was trying to build the business. It, it, it helped the success of the business, but it had a cost for me. And it took me around six to nine months to become fully myself again. It took me six to nine months to rest from this three months of intense trying to do everything and find the courage to leave the job. Let me stop here and see what questions we have before I move on to the next three steps. So one person asked, um, what's your definition of success, Katerina? Yes, it's funny because I have written an article about this and I have a very intricate definition. Let me, let me see if I can remember it. But there were three parts, if I could remember, of the, my definition of success. Success is dancing. And by dancing mean it's not going from A to B. I don't believe life is a journey. Even though I described this is the beginning, this is where I'm now. I think it's like dance. Like there's not a beginning and an end. It's the pleasure. So for me, it's enjoying the moment. The second piece of my definition of success is inviting more people to dance with you. There's something around impact. And we, you wouldn't be in this call if you didn't care about helping other people. But as coaches, we have to be helping other people. And then... There's something around improving your, your flexibility and your rhythm and your moves as you're dancing. So there's something around getting better, evolution and growth over lifetimes as one of my coaches. So that's my three-piece definition of success. Success is dancing, inviting other people to dance with you and getting more playful and uh, flexible and better in your dance moves um, continuously. We've got uh, another question. Um... And it's about it from Stephen, who wanted to ask you about what are your top tips for capturing, capturing a substantial client base without a career background uh, with the world's best company? I love that question. And um, I know I promised to, to share um, this. So there's a lot I can say about this. You can, but the, I don't think what you need is the tactics. You can read, there are so many things you can do, but it doesn't matter so much what you do. It matters who you are when you do it. And there are so many coaches that are hugely successful that didn't even go to university. 
So for me, and that's my fifth tip here, and I, I wonder whether I should answer this question now or wait, waiting for then. What are my top tips for gaining clients when you don't have the credibility? Okay. So if, you, if we're talking about you building a brand, where can you get your credibility from? You could get it. I got it from Google. I got it from my education initially. Uh, now I continue getting it. Like I got published by a pen. Like I continue being associated with bigger brands. So are there any bigger brands that you can associate yourself? It could be your client. I coach people in this company. It could be your, your education. Like initially, before my first education, when I invested in my MBA at INSEAD, that's why I invested before, because before INSEAD, my company was called Circus, Circus Marketing Communication. I was coming from the poorest part of Europe in, in Greece that was the strategy. Can I associate with a bigger brand so that I could land the job at Google as well? So there's something to be said around brands. It's not the only way though. I have seen successful coaches that that's the prosperous coach approach that you just help people and you become so good at helping people and you create a word of mouth business. So there are many techniques you can speak. You're going to become a speaker. You can become a, a writer. For me, it was mostly writing. It, 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 you can become a networker. There's so many things you can do. You just need to find what's aligned from you. I've seen people sharing your ideas. Like I, I follow someone on LinkedIn, Justin Welsh for his LinkedIn tips. I don't know the companies he worked before. Like he says, yeah, I worked for this startups. I have no idea. But he, ha he has been sharing his ideas about growing your LinkedIn following on LinkedIn and he has 100,000 followers on LinkedIn now by just sharing his ideas. So one is associating yourself with brands. The second is sharing your ideas. And content creation has been a huge part of my journey. But nothing of that matters unless you do it because it's fun for you. Unless you, it's, It matters more who you are rather than when you do something versus doing any strategy can work. I know coaches that have used any of those strategies successfully that doesn't mean you go to a course and they say, oh, I, I can tell you, I wrote articles and this is how I got the clients. It doesn't mean it's going to work for everyone. Of you. Do you like writing to start with? It needs to be aligned with what you love doing. Um, and Malcolm is asking us, uh, where did you blog? I started blogging on Medium. I stopped now blogging on Medium. I continue, I continue blogging on LinkedIn. Then... Uh, Stop, I stopped having the views like in 2018 when I left Google my LinkedIn article garnered 50,000 views then it stopped garnering any views now LinkedIn changed it to newsletters and I have it on my website then I was blogging for Huffington Post for a while because they found an article on Medium and by the way the reason they found the article on Medium is that I shared the article in my company I shared it in a group I thought it would be relevant and then I realized the group had 3,000 people. So 3,000 people in my company, for those of you who have a day job, saw the article. And then the algorithm at Medium said, oh, that must be a hot article. So somehow it reached the Huffington Post editor. And then uh, when I realized that, I started pitching my articles. I pitched it to Fast Company. I blog for Thrive Global. But right now, I just have a newsletter. Um, that you can subscribe when you get my gift if you want to, and then I republish on LinkedIn. That's my blogging platform. Bo is asking you if you had a financial safety before leaving. I did, and I do. It makes things so much easier because if you don't, and I, I do recommend two years of savings because I said two years um, because you can relax, especially because I told you the first nine months I was exhausted. I didn't even want to build my business. I was trying to recover from my exhaustion of trying to, to do all the things at the same time. Uh, so having the, this financial uh, cushion was hugely important and it helps gaining coaching clients because nobody, people can smell desperation it's like flirting, right? Imagine like we've all flirted and you go to the bar and if someone is desperate, it's not attractive. It's the same when you're talking to prospects and clients. So I would suggest if it's possible, 
to have this financial cushion so you don't stress yourself, you don't burn out, you don't come across as, as desperate. You have the you give yourself these two years to explore what works for you in terms of business development. Can you do it without that cushion? Yes, I've seen people doing it. Is it more stressful and harder? Yes, it is. Could you just repeat um, the second point as well? Some people didn't catch the second point. Let go of unaligned workplaces and people. For that, it was I, I used it to tell the story how I left Google. I keep doing that. Because as a coach, I keep finding, you will keep finding yourself having unaligned clients, for example, and that will give you, what are the things that are unaligned? Let me talk a little bit about that. It is things you have either for ego, it's a big brand, and this could be your employer or your uh, clients, or you have them for safety. And again, it could be your employer or clients. And I've found every time for me to allow to get to the next level, I need to let something go that is not aligned anymore with where I want to go. You need, you need to make space. So that is my second point. Uh, let me move to the next, and I'll take more questions. I love your questions to make this even more relevant. The, the third point is make investments aligned with your future self. And obviously a big one you will see in my journey is investments in education. Like I made, I, I, what I usually say, I was making less, I was making, I don't know, 25K when I invested 75K for in the INSEAD MBA and that's how I got Google. I invested in the AMEC executive um, masters. But even smaller investments, I remember the first 500 pounds out of my pocket to do my logo for my business that's an invest it doesn't have all education is a huge one for me and I always invest in education but this money towards the logo without even having a legal entity something changes and there's been research around this it's Benjamin Hardy did the research and, and figured out the difference from the people who are entrepreneurs and the people who want to be entrepreneurs and the key difference was a point of no return, which was usually an investment. It could be leaving your job as a point of no return, obviously, but usually it wasn't, it was an investment. And because there's something there, when you are investing, you're sending a signal first to your subconscious and then to the world that you believe in your vision because you're betting your money on it. There's something there in the commitment. And sometimes it works I realized that the month that Penguin reached out to ask me to write a book for Penguin, it was a month I had invested in a business accelerator for people who wanted to write their own books. And I thought I would self-publish. I had invested, uh, like, it was almost 10% of the income of my coaching business at the time in 2019 to this accelerator. And then somehow... Penguin reached out. It doesn't like people can believe on attracting energetic match, being an energetic match. But me having a clear vision, I knew I wanted to write a book, me making an investment. When Penguin reached out, I could grab this opportunity because I knew, oh, this is what I want. Unless we have done step number one, which is clarified what do we want, and then taking some moves, whether it's letting go of things to make space or making an investment. We don't know. The opportunity will come and you won't recognize it. You will feel fear instead of excitement, unless you've done steps one to three. A lot of the times you won't know unless you have clarified that this is what I want. Like even now, uh, in two weeks ago, they invited me to give a TEDx. Unless I had done, I had done a speaker training two years ago. Unless I had done that back then, I don't think I would be like TEDx. Oh my goodness, that's too much work. I'm like, I don't want to, doesn't matter. It's not relevant. But now I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do because I spent some time thinking about this and it was in my vision and I did make an investment. Um, okay, let me move to the next step. Take inspired action. What does this even mean? So there will be some times that you will feel called to do something. 
you know, feel like fun, something exciting. It, it, that may, it, it might feel like a step in the right direct, direction, but doesn't necessarily guarantee results. It's not like a, a business decision with an ROI. And I'll give you two examples. When I was at Google, I said, I, I felt called to volunteer for a business incubator Google had to, to coach entrepreneurs. And I did this on top of my day job. Okay, I coached them. I didn't get any money of this, but I, I thought it would be fun. Then I put it on my bio. And in my first year as a coaching business, INSEAD, the business school, found on my bio, they were looking for someone who had experience coaching entrepreneurs. And they found this experience, which I did it because I was feeling called to do. I wasn't even paid. And that's how I got to coach for INSEAD. The other thing is, in 2019, I think, I, th I said, again, I was looking to get inspired by the successful coaches. I said, how about I interview the top women coaches in the world? I had this idea. And I got this list, coaching gurus, and I reached out to Brenda Benz. She's in Singapore. I said, can I interview you? I'll write an article about you on Thrive Global. And she said, yeah, sure. So I interview her. I learned from her wisdom. I write an article. The article didn't even do extremely well, right? I didn't even get paid to do this job. It was more fun. Like, let me learn from the best coaches in the world. Let me interview them. That's a cool thing to do. It was this article that the Penguin editor found. Like, I've written hundreds of articles. I write an article every two weeks. Somehow, it was not even my knowledge in the article. It was me interviewing Brenda Benz on Thrive Global that the Penguin editor found and said, let me reach out. I want and then offer me to write a book for Penguin. And I wrote Hold Successful Meetings and it was launched last year. And I, these things, I did them out of, because it felt, oh, I am called to do this. I, I couldn't have predicted the ripple effects that one of those things will get me in Seattle as a client. The other one of those things will get me Penguin, a book contract with Penguin, but it felt fun. So what I want to invite you is if you have these flashes of inspiration, follow them, trust them, do them. Okay, let's, do, do we have any more questions? And then I have a final step too. Yes, we do. Um, for people who found um, writing difficult, do you have any tips? Don't write, speak, um, if speaking is easier. But by the way, you don't have to write content. Most of my associates don't write content. They are incredible coaches. They love to coach. They, they get better at their craft all the time. And we have a great win-win partnership. I want the best coaches from my clients. So I bring those associates in. I'm good at creating content and bringing the clients. They don't have to worry about business development. I do the business development, but I want to trust my clients to the best coaches. So there are ways you can be a purist coach. If you want to do that, I suggest explore the associate route, become associate so other people can do the hard work of finding the clients and closing those deals. But if you have ideas, for me, the more, the more I, I actually identify more as a content creator. Now, at this point of my journey, I, I started as a coach and the more I write, the more content I produce, it, it's a, a virtual cycle for me because the coaching inspires the content and the content brings the clients for the coaching, right? So, but if you want to share your ideas, you could do an audio. If you have, like for me, I think in the future, it will be mostly audio because I don't, I don't like to have to make up and, and do all those things. It could be video. It could be you talking to podcasts if you like speaking or with videos, audios, speaking on stages, if you want to share your ideas, it could be social media, but you don't have to. You don't have to be a content creator and a coach. You can pure, purely be a coach. Charles is also asking about the marketing mix. So how much um, marketing do you do? So I haven't advertised yet so I, I don't know about the paid side of marketing 
also, I have to say my first degree is marketing. So people say, oh, you're good because you know marketing. And it's true. Like for me, it helped me have an understanding and a lot more like people hate marketing for me. And that's, let me actually move to the, ne the last step here. Um, let me find my card actually. Live your best life. So, and that includes marketing. I love writing. I started writing before I even knew I wanted to be a coach. My first article was how I stopped breastfeeding and what this meant for my family. Then I started writing about my travels in, in Thailand. So for me, writing is my marketing. It started as blogging. Now it's more social media, actually. I just post daily on LinkedIn. If you want to connect there, uh, I'll be happy to, to connect with you. And, and that's it. I don't, like, what does it mean, marketing? Because I, I love it. I love it because it helps me process my thoughts. Uh, and, but that's works for me. It doesn't mean it will work for you. It doesn't mean you need to do what I do. Live your best life. What would be fun? What would be exciting for you to do in your coaching business? What would be fun? And live your best life is, is more than that. There's something there that yes, you can be a purist coach and the, what we learned at Ashridge to be very facilitative and helping people reach their best self. But there is something there when you implement and you do this for yourself. And I've identified it can make the difference to the coaches that are paid normal rate and the coaches that are paid a huge rate is if not only you help other people live their best life and be successful, but you do it for yourself. Like, it's really hard. Like, it's really hard. Would you hire a personal trainer to hire you when you see they're very unhealthy? There's something there about how can you help people be a good leader, have a happy life, have good relationships if you don't drink your own medicine? So that if you want to become a successful coach is how can you have the best life? And I realized when I realized that, and it, again, it was through pain. In the summer, I got COVID and I was sick and I had to cancel clients and I had to cancel speeches. And I was like, this is not working. I need to be taking more holiday. And I booked the 12 weeks of holiday and I'm in four day week on Fridays, usually I do self-care. And the business is doing better than ever. And it's even more, when I come back from holiday, I have even more inbound requests, potentially because I, I write anyway, like I will post and my social media is, is more inspired when I'm having fun because I have, I'm having fun. When you see, you're walking out of the pub and you see a great vibe in there and people having fun, you want to get into the pub. So that's what we want to be as well as coaches. Like you will see when you have a big insight or a breakthrough, you will attract the clients that need this breakthrough. When you are working on having your best life, people will want to be with you to, because if you have awakened something in yourself, people, people being in relationship with you through coaching, something will awaken them too. It's really hard to do it for other people when you have uh, your defenses up and you're you, you're not working, you're not walking the, the walk yourself. When you do the blogging, um, do you set some time during the day to do it when you're very busy? Yes, I have Wednesday. I don't have meetings. And by the way, the reason I wrote a book called Hold Successful Meetings is because I hated meetings, most meetings when I was in corporate life. So, and it's great to have this book out because it's an excuse as well when people reach out and can I pick your brain? Can I have some of your time? I said, look, I've written this book called Successful Meetings and I don't take meetings. Like I'm very, um, very strict on the meetings I take. It's either, it's, it's for my clients. Like literally I meet with my clients because when I have free time, I want to be creative and help more people through my writing. And I want to be with my kids really. So I have Wednesdays usually for content creation. And uh, I think 18 months ago, I committed to a bi-weekly newsletter. And I do the newsletter rain or shine every two weeks. I, I initially I started monthly, by the way. It doesn't mean you need to start with bi-weekly. I started with a monthly newsletter. 
And, and that commitment has helped me, but it doesn't matter. You need, it doesn't mean you need to do it. And sometimes, you know what? I reach it. It's Wednesday. My, my newsletter goes to my list every Thursday, and then it gets republished on LinkedIn on Fridays. And sometimes it feels like a drag. It feels, oh. And then I, I realize now I have so much, I, if it really feels like a drag and I don't have time, I may repurpose something, maybe for my book. I've written a whole book. So I'll, I may take something there and I'll repurpose it. I have, to, have done this like in the last three months. But then last Wednesday, these five steps came through in my newsletter. I was preparing for this talk and I, it was going to be a lot more tactical. And, and because I, I received this TEDx, I was thinking, why do I attract these opportunities? Because people ask me, how did you write, get a publishing contract? I don't know. They wrote to me. How did you get a TEDx? They wrote to me. I was like, wow. And, and I, I wrote this five steps and I felt, oh, this is creative work. And I loved it. So there, I, I have committed to the writing. I have Wednesdays off, off coaching to write. Sometimes I will write it last minute. I'm a last minute. It, it will be ready last minute and then I'll have my husband oh the newsletter needs to go out and you need to proofread it um but it, this commitment has also allowed me what is it that I want to share with my community what did I learn in the last two weeks what's important for me right now let me share that right sorry I'm, I'm reading the chat um hi any suggestion advice in terms of becoming an associate how do you go about this? Yes, I will tell you how I choose my associates. And so the truth is to become an associate, I, I will look at credentials. I don't think necessarily you can, I think you can be successful with no credentials because if you ha have a huge brand, if you do a lot of content creation, but I will look either someone has a postgraduate degree a lot of my associates actually come from the Asheridge world. Like I will ask my Asheridge tutors, who would you recommend? Um, or I would look people being at least PCC accredited IACF. And the reason is I'm not a huge company. I don't, I don't have the resources to check whether someone is a great coach and interview and do them 10 interviews until I trust them with my clients. Like I will look at the credentials so if you're looking for associate work, I think that's important to know, to know. Most of the businesses that look for associates would look at credentials. And I think credentials are good for your confidence as well. Um, and, and then what else? I, I will sometimes look, because I need people on certain locations, I will look through my network um, or, and word of mouth. And the same things like for associate work, if you have a brand, like right now, I was looking someone to, I'm coaching a team and I need someone to coach the CEO. And I found someone who's a really good CEO coach and he, they don't have, they don't have a master's in coaching like I do, but, but they've written like hundreds of articles and they've been a CEO themselves. And, and this coach needed more like a mentor. It was their brand and their writing that I said, you know what, I think he would be a good coach for my client. Um, that's how I will choose. I will. I will choose my my associates. That said, I did reach out when I was looking for associate work in the beginning of my journey. I did reach out, and most people were open to having a chat if, if they were looking uh, for associates. And by the way, some of my associates do things I cannot do. Like I have someone doing presentation skills coaching. Like it's not my expertise. I have someone doing management training. Uh, now I have two people, one is um, specializing on burnout and the other is specializing on imposter syndrome. So I love having those type of niche coaches because then it's so clear for me, this client has this challenge. Let me match them with this coach. Lovely. Like if I can give work to my associates, it's, it's greater because then I can have more time to write and, and generate more long-term assets for the business. Another question about rate. So how do you decide your coaching rate? Yes. Um, oh, what I'll say is one thing of, I think relatively good of the burnout that I had when I left Google was I was burnout. So I remember it was a client there that wanted to, me to coach them. And I was too exhausted to coach anyone. So I gave them like a high rate. And then they said, yes. 
and I coached them, wonderful relationship. But then because I had given this high rate to this person, it wasn't really fair <laughs> to the other people. Right now, I go with instinct because I, now I, I do product, right? I have a course about team, how to get your team's genius. I, I have this six week program around defining your vision. I, I have a, a day with me. I have different products and I, I totally trust my inner voice. I feel into the price. Does this feel appropriate? Does this feel exciting for me? And and it's, I think it's an exchange of energy. Like I told you that when I started, I was coaching pro bono, by the way, right? It depends where you are in your journey. Like for the 37% of you that I was coaching pro bono for, for years. <laughs> and, then, and then I was choosing the price that felt right. And, and I think it's important because I realized on my associate, when I'm an associate and I wasn't paid what initially my associate work was paid, I don't know, half of what I was making with my private clients. But then I was, as I was raising my prices, my associate work started being one fifth, even one tenth of what I was making for my private clients. And that wasn't feeling right. So I was starting letting go associate work because I realized it's important for me to feel that this energy exchange feels good. And by the way, you can see my prices on my website. I'm not gonna share them here because they change all the time. <laughs> I do raise my prices all the time. Um, and, and this will be a video that will leave long term, but I also decided I will have transparency of the prices on the website. And whenever I feel, you know what, I have too much work, I'll go and raise the prices. And that's how I manage demand and supply. So to follow up on this, um, how did you manage to transition from pro bono to start getting paid for your, the coaching you offered? So the pro bono was within the company. It was within Accelerator and it was, I gave uh, three, co three, I coached three clients in my alumni community. And then when I was in Thailand, which was during my maternity leave, a, a pro bono client reached out two years later for coaching. And that was the first client I charged because I had done, I had coached him pro bono. I wasn't going to coach him again pro bono. And, and by, by then I was more mature. And then three clients reached out at the same time as well through my writing and talking more about coaching. And then I set up a limited company and I started charging. I charged before I left Google, even though it was just four clients in total. And it wasn't the money, obviously, it was nothing compared to, to my Google salary, but it was mentally important to prove to myself I can make money through this. There are people who are willing to pay me for this. So I, I usually advise my clients psychologically, it helped me making even like a few hundred pounds in total before I left Google. People are willing to pay for this, pay me for this. It was a, 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 an important proof of concept. A question from Diana. Do you focus on a specific niche? And if so, what helped you narrow down your focus? And two, do you, do you find any particular day in the week that is most popular with coaches? So the niche, I always struggle with the niche. I do believe, put it, my coach hat out and my marketing hat in. Marketing-wise, if you have a niche, you will be, it will be a lot easier to market. Like this, these two coaches I mentioned, the imposter syndrome coach and the burnout coach, I refer business to them all the time because I get a client with burnout. I'm like, here's your coach. I get a client with imposter syndrome. Here's your, um, I, there's the other coach that I reached out. He only coaches CEOs of tech companies, nothing. He doesn't coach the team. He doesn't coach the anyone else of funded, VC funded. So from a marketing perspective, brilliant if you can niche should you do it in the beginning no because you don't know what's your niche you don't know what you like you don't you don't even know you know for me it I didn't want a niche it didn't feel like fun that said the clearer I be I, I made what I work on and I think when I'm the, my first step it was to say I work on clarity and leadership and now I made it even more specific I do vision and team development those are the two things 
and it took a lot of years and I've and I saw what I was writing about, what I enjoyed working on, what my IP was. And now I, I made it for the first time a lot more specific. If you want to clarify your vision, life, role, entrepreneur, um, your business vision, I have an IP on that. And that will probably be my next book or my TEDx. We'll see. Uh, you want to develop a great team. I'm your person for that. It came through work and through seeing what type of roles I, I was uh, working with, I was enjoying working with. And I also, for one to one coaching, I, again, very recently, I went very specific on my psychographic. Like I, on my website, I went and I posted on social media. You know, in coaching, that people come to coaching either because people tell them they're too little or they're too much. Like you're not assertive enough, you're not confident enough, you're not, is the too little and the too much, you're like intimidating, triggering. I realized that I'm better with the too much people. So for the first time I owned this, I was like, if you're a person that people tell you you are too much and they find you intimidating um, and you'll break the rules and you're this type of person, this is the person I enjoy coaching. And, and I became, now it's clear on my website. And, and when I posted it on social media, I had my dream clients commenting below. And I was like, okay, I, I should have had the courage to be very specific. This is the type of client I would like to coach for one-to-one. There is a more uh, specific question about the um, the AMEC. Um, this person, uh, Bo, doesn't like writing and was wondering how um, did you manage to write the reflective journey? Any tips on how to write your reflective journey? Great. I just wrote on the chat the gift for the great day visualization so you don't miss it and you'll, you'll have it in the follow-up. You know what? I struggle with the amic as well, the, the, the work. Um, and I don't know why. I, I, and, and that's why it was transformational. I remember when Penguin reached out, I thought, oh, I'm going to struggle. I actually, I think I struggled more to write my thesis than writing a book that was published by Penguin. But it was transformational. So the... My tip for you is it changed me. I get me to know myself better. So I would say there's no way over it. There's no way under it. The only way is through it. Like I, I don't have any tips. That said, it helped. It took me four years, by the way. So my tip would be don't stress yourself to finish it in a certain... It, it, I think it was better. I, it allowed me to grow with the master's. It, it was incredible your journey of transformations for me. Um, so yeah, give yourself some space. Don't, don't put some, so much pressure and, and trust the process that what Amak asks you to do, it is for your transformation and transformation is challenging. What percentage of your time is spent pitching to clients, coaching or corporate uh, prospect? Oh, I don't pitch. <laughs> I don't do corporate prospect. But that's my best life. Maybe you're great. You enjoy pitching. Um, the reason I put the prices on the website is that people come to me inbound through my comments, through my, my content. And I say, great, look at the program. This is the programs I have. Um, and most of them, they will look at the price and it won't be a good fit. So I, I actually slashed my sales calls because I, I, there was a point I was having sale, four sales calls a week and it, I don't enjoy them. And my ambition for the future is I will have zero sales calls, like that my brand will become so strong that um, this is my programs. You can watch my tens of videos on YouTube just to get a feel of, we can, I can answer questions on DM. Um, my, my future vision is I won't have any sales calls. And for a corporation, if it's a big project, they're asking me to coach their top 20, top, top 10, and that's where I bring the associates. I, of course, I will have a call. Um, but I don't, I try to minimize the sales and spend more time on creation. Like I think now if I focus to, to, grow, to give a great TEDx, I think that will bring a lot more business than me. And it's more fun for me, like me knocking doors and calling. But that doesn't mean like for you, if you love it, go for it. What matters is to do what feels fun rather than what I'm supposed to be doing because someone in the internet said, this is what I need to do to be successful. Okay, well, I think we've answered all the questions. Any other question from everyone? Um, I like Charles' 
comment, zero sales call, that would definitely be a best life. Absolutely. Fantastic. Thank you. Should, should we close it off then if we answered all the questions? That's great timing, by the way. Yes, I think it's perfect. Yes. So um, any other question? Otherwise, we will we'll, we'll finish now. Yes. And I hope, well, thank you very much for joining us. And I hope you have found it inspiring and helpful. Um, any other question about the master's exec